Hey, I'm Marco. I'm one of the members of LES CSS. Uh, just a little background, we're a community organization of people that are really obsessed with cactuses, succulents, um, xeric plants in general. Um, and we run these meetings once a month. Uh, and we're really excited to have Matt Opal with us from the University of Connecticut to talk about con conophytums. And um, we'll put a link in our chat for donations as we're trying to um, build a greenhouse in a little community space and anything helps. So we'll put that in there and I'll let Matt take it away. Okay, yeah, let me uh, put the presentation on full screen. Um, yeah, just give me a yell if I'm running out of time. Uh, you know, it should be about an hour long talk, but uh, you know, maybe sure. uh, if I'm getting towards an hour, uh, might wanna let me know and I'll speed things up if I need to. Absolutely, yeah, I'll, I'll keep an eye on it. All right, thanks. Yeah, I don't have a clock sitting around here and the clock <laughs> on the computer disappeared when I made it full screen, but yeah. All right, so I'm gonna be talking about the genus Conophytum, succulent plant royalty. And uh, the conophytum in the picture here is the royal conophytum, conophytum regale. Um, but I sort of gave that this talk, uh, that title, uh, just in the past couple of years. I was uh, talking to some of the officers about this a little while ago. Um, the conophytum has become extremely popular. It's uh, uh, people at say Mesa Gardens say that it's uh, by far the most popular genus of plants that they sell these days. And it's really just happened since 2019 or so. It was maybe a little bit obscure before then, but the, the popularity of this genus has really taken off. And so they're sort of the royal succulent plants of at least the moment. Uh, they've kind of displaced, uh, say, maybe Haworthias were the, the previous uh, sort of premier group of succulent plants for collectors. Um, yeah. So here's a, a shot of uh, the Conophytum collection at the University of Connecticut. These were sort of my research plants back when I was doing my PhD and they sort of morphed into the university's collection of Conophytum plants. And there's some possibility that in the future it might have this recognized by the USDA as the national collection of Conophytums. Um, so it's a quite a large collection I've got here, shown here in bloom at a, uh, you know, probably in September or so, the peak of the flowering season. Uh, here's some conophytums in the wild in South Africa. This is in a coastal Namaqualand in the, the western part of South Africa. And uh, conophytum minutum here with some other succulents. There's a, uh, looks like Crassula muscosa or something there. The big succulent in the background is Woolia, another mesen in the same family as conophytum. And this is uh, Oh, maybe a Phyllobolus or something, probably another MSM. So I, I mentioned that the, the conophytum popularity has increased quite a bit since 2019 or so. Um, it's gratifying in a way. I've been interested in these plants for a long time, and it's nice that other people are finding out about them, but it has a, a darker side as well. This is a, a whole mess of conophytum calculus and other conophytum plants that were confiscated from poachers in South Africa. And uh, so apparently confiscation, confiscations of conophytums like this uh, illegally collected happen on a re really regular basis these days. And probably a lot more than that actually get through. Um, so there's a, a serious problem with poaching and it's actually impacting the conservation of these plants at this point. It's a, kind of a bad situation in that respect. So an introduction to the genus. Um, conophytums are you know, what are commonly called mesems. And those are members of the plant family Isoaceae. And so it's a family, sort of a large family of almost all succulent plants and uh, most diverse in South Africa, but found all over the world. Um, certain characteristics, the fruits are hygrocastic capsules, which means that they open up in response to water. Um, the flowers don't have true petals. It's thought that the petals in the, the mesems 
what looks like the petals anyway, are actually modified stamens or petaloid staminodes. And uh, the epidermis, uh, at least in uh, a primitive state, in the more primitive mesems, has bladder cells, these sort of fat water storing cells. And those give this family the other name, the ice plants, because they sort of look like they have frost on them because of these uh, water-filled bladder cells on the uh, skin of the plants. So it's, uh, it's got the name Mesems. It's as a, as a contraction of the former family name, Mesembryanthanaceae. Um, it's now included, uh, the Mesems are included in the family Isoaceae, uh, two different subfamilies in there. Uh, including the Ruchioidae, which includes Conophytum, and also Lithops and most of the other succulent plants in the in the MSM group that people grow. And it's a, it's a pretty large group. It's about 120 genera and 1,700 species. And uh, again, mostly in South, Southern Africa, but other species are native to other parts of the world, um, mostly as coastal plants. So there's a number of Carperbrotus and members of the actual genus Mesembryanthemum and some other related things that grow uh, primarily in coastal areas and the other continents and uh, you know, various common names. So the genus Conophytum is uh, one of the larger individual genera in the, the Mesem group uh, with uh, almost 110 species and probably another hundred or so subspecies uh, uh, underneath various of, those, various of those species, subspecies and varieties. Um, it's divided up taxonomically into 16 sections. And uh, let's see, it's uh, primarily native to winter rainfall regions in Southern Africa and uh, gets up into Namibia a little bit into Southern Namibia. Um, the genus is characterized by highly fused together succulent leaves. So these plant bodies that you see here are actually pairs of leaves that are fused together. And the, uh, the flowers also have sort of a tubular structure at the base, which is uh, composed of fused together petaloid staminodes. So um, they have that floral tube at the base, uh, which has nectar at the bottom. And, uh, the, the pollinators of these plants are mostly long tongue insect insects, um, especially uh, long tongue flies, apparently, um, which can reach the ne nectar at the bottom of that floral tube and are attracted by the flower colors. All right, so I said that they're primarily winter growing. And here's a, you know, a climate map of uh, Southern Africa. And this blue area here is uh, blue and into the, the greens out here to the east and uh, up to the north are areas that receive primarily rainfall in the winter time. And uh, that's, that's really the part of Southern Africa where Conophytum is native and some other various other groups of winter growing succulent plants. Um, so that part of uh, the continent receives uh, most of its moisture and it's a lot of it is fairly dry, but what moisture is available is uh, mostly falling as rain during the winter time. And uh, these areas also get some fog and dew uh, during the winter and also at other times of the year that may help to keep these small succulent plants alive. But uh, the primary source of moisture is winter rains. And so Conophytum and a lot of other groups of plants that are native to these areas uh, grow mostly during the cooler months. And uh, I'll mention here that, uh, you know, South Africa and Namibia are deep in the Southern hemisphere. And so their seasons are reversed from what ours are. Um, but the plants are responding to temperatures and day length and the availability of moisture to determine when they grow. And when they're moved to the Northern hemisphere for us, they very quickly adjust uh, to the reverse seasons and they will grow in our winters. Uh, so they're, they're growing when the temperatures are cool and uh, when the days are getting shorter is uh, sort of what triggers their growth. And so they're, they're not aware of what's happening in South Africa. And so they adjust to our seasons, which can provide, uh, can make for some problems with cultivation. They, they wanna grow at the time of year when we've got the least amount of light available and they're often kind of hogs for sunlight. 
So these are dormant conophytums in late summer. And the, there's kind of the scaly covering or sheath over the surface of the plants. And that's the dried up remains of the old leaves from the previous growing season. So these are just starting to grow at this point. Uh, this is probably taken in August or so. Um, the plants hide for the whole hot season during the summertime underneath the dried up remains of the previous year's leaves. And uh, that forms kind of a protective covering which uh, prevents excessive uh, heating up and evaporation and loss of moisture. And just a little bit later on in the fall, the plants have absorbed water and they're flowering and the new leaves are exposed. So this is a little bit later in the year than the last photograph. And then in the first part of the talk, I'll talk a little bit about the cultivation of these plants and uh, go over how I grow them. And I keep some plants in the greenhouse. I keep some plants at home on windowsills and under lights as well. I assume most of you, if you've got these sort of plants, uh, probably have them uh, under lights. But So I'll talk a bit about that. Um, so the first consideration and the, the primary consideration for really growing conophytums well is uh, the amount of light that they can get. And uh, when they're growing, uh, you know, like I said before, they want to grow during uh, the coldest and darkest time in our winter. Um, so they, they need really as much light as you can get them. And here I've got two different plants. Uh, the one in the upper part here was grown out in the greenhouse at Yukon. And it's nice and compact and has good color and the, the plants are uh, really kind of strong. This plant here is uh, a, a clone of the same plant. This is grown from a cutting of the same plant, uh, but I'm keeping it as sort of a pet plant at home on my windowsill. And this is a south facing windowsill. It's about as much natural light as I can get the plants. And there's some Orthios lithops here as well, and they're doing okay. And the conophytum is okay. It's actually flowering and it does produce seed for me. Um, but it's not quite as nice looking as the plant that gets the full greenhouse sun. Um, it's a little bit stretchy. The colors are a little bit washed out. Um, it's definitely reaching for the light a bit. So uh, these are definitely plants that during the winter growing season want as much light as possible. During the summertime when they're dormant, uh, they could probably, especially, I don't know how many of you have access to a greenhouse, so probably not that many. Um, but especially under greenhouse cultivation, they need a little bit of shade in the summertime and they can even kind of go into positions underneath the bench where they um, don't get as much light. Um, it is possible to burn these plants, especially getting into later spring and in the summertime if uh, they get exposed to too strong sunlight and uh, sort of dry out too much and get too hot. Um, so that can be a danger with conophytums. But during the winter time, it's uh, difficult to give them enough light. Uh, that'll be the main limiting factor. Here's um, a couple of my setups that I've had at home over the years. Uh, fluorescent lights are probably a bit on the, the way out, but I used to use uh, daylight deluxe uh, fluorescent tubes to grow conophytums uh, at home with the tubes just a few inches off of the surface of the plants, so quite close to the plants to give them really good light. I have moved over in recent years to LED lights. And so uh, this is sort of a typical setup for me. I've actually got the setup of uh, this cart in front of a window so the plants get, do get some natural light as well. And uh, they're broad spectrum grow lights and also a few uh, cool daylight shop lights, uh, LED as well in order to uh, make it a little bit easier to look at the plants and view their colors uh, and uh, you know, not as harsh with the typical LED grow light, uh, bluish purple color. Um, so yeah, the shop lights are mostly for my viewing comfort and to enable me to see the plants with uh, slightly more natural colors when I'm looking at them in the evening. Um, these lights, by the way, I keep them on just about constant 12 hours. Uh, I, I might dial back the time that the lights are on uh, a little bit during the winter time to give them a little bit of seasonality that way. But the, the plants pick up on the changes in temperature as well as uh, what light they get in through the window as well. 
So that sort of keeps them on the right schedule and uh, gives them their day length cues that they need to grow properly and go through their proper seasonal cycle. All right, uh, temperatures that you need for cultivation. This is a neat shot from uh, Carel Dutoy, who uh, runs a succulent plant tour um, group out of uh, Springbok in Namaqua land and sort of the, the center of Conophytum territory. Um, so these plants do experience quite chilly temperatures in the wintertime. This is after wet snow and the Conophytum pagii here is uh, soaking wet and got a little bit of snow on top of it. So a lot of Conophytum species grow in areas where they get um, at least a few frosts during the wintertime, a few light frosts, and uh, during uh, exceptional cold periods might even get a little bit of snowfall. And a few species even grow on higher mountain areas where it's uh, more reliably snowy and cold during the depths of winter. But anyway, so this is the growing season for these plants. Uh, they're used to growing in these kind of conditions. This is when moisture is available for them in the wild. And you wouldn't necessarily want to try to imitate this type of situation in a pot. Um, might be dangerous. And uh, another sort of consideration is that uh, what the plants can deal with in the wild is not necessarily what's best for them and what produces uh, the best growth on, on a windowsill or under a light setup. Um, but it indicates that the plants can take a certain amount of cold and really conophytums are plants that put on their best growth if they do get a colder period during the winter. So I'd say that ideal temperatures for conophytum during the winter time is maybe down to about 50 or even into the 40s at nighttime and then warming up into closer to room temperature and you know 60s or 70 degrees during the daytime. Um, but they really appreciate cooler temperatures and also that sort of daily cycling of uh, warmer and cooler temperatures when they're growing during the winter time. And uh, the plants really struggle if uh, you try to keep them in a really overheated apartment where the temperature is constantly up in the 70s uh, all the time, all day and all night. Um, they don't do well in those sorts of conditions and the growth tends to become uh, sort of weak and irregular and uh, the plants uh, often decline and eventually die under those sorts of conditions. Um, so they, they do appreciate cooler temperatures if you've got a cooler part of uh, your house or apartment, uh, or you can uh, moderate the temperature so it's uh, cooler at night is uh, really what they like. During the summertime, they deal with uh, sort of whatever temperatures uh, we have outside uh, for the greenhouse plants or uh, whatever temperature it gets up to inside at, in the house. Um, yeah, they, they do fine with the sort of temperatures we have uh, in the Northeast outside during the summertime. Uh, soil mixtures. Uh, people obsess about soil mixtures. I'm not sure it's as critical. Conophytums and a lot of other succulent plants uh, can make do with a lot of different sorts of soil mixtures, but this is what I generally use for conophytums. And
and sand. Um, so it might be hard to find this if you're living in the city, but uh, it's something I can get off of the roadside or out of a gravel pit in my area. Um, you can also use just regular soilless mixes instead of the sandy loam, but you do want something in the soil that will hold a little bit of water and nutrients. Um, I don't fertilize these plants very much. So this is a, a mostly inorganic mix or almost entirely inorganic mix. And it doesn't contain much nutrients and I don't generally add much nutrients, especially for adult plants. Maybe once or twice a season, you can add a dilute water soluble balanced fertilizer, um, you know, diluted to maybe a quarter or half strength to the soil just to provide them a little bit of nitrogen and other nutrients they need, um, but they don't need much. And if they get too much of nutrients, uh, they tend to split open and uh, produce very green, weak growth. And that often invites rot and other problems. A little bit about propagating these plants. So you can propagate conophytums from cuttings fairly easily. Um, they're not like crassulas where you can propagate them from leaf cuttings. These cuttings must have a little bit of stem at the base of these uh, pairs of leaves that are fused together. Um, they, they need that bit of stem in order to actually grow a new plant. Sometimes a severed conophytum leaf will actually produce a little bit of roots, but I've never seen one uh, actually regenerate a new plant from that. They don't seem to be able to grow new shoots from strictly leaf tissue, unlike some other succulents. Um, uh, cuttings, I usually take them at the end of summer or in early fall is probably the best time as the, the plants are just starting to grow. You can take them at any time of year pretty much and uh, nurse them along through the summer where they might not do much if you took cuttings at this time of year. Um, but they really root the best and establish best uh, as temperatures are cooling off in the autumn. And you can use rooting hormone or you could not use rooting hormone. It's uh, probably not necessary. Uh, seeds are more complicated, but it's a nice way to get a larger number of plants uh, for not too much money, maybe. Conif items are definitely getting more expensive these days. Um, but conophytum plants, by the way, in order to pollinate them, you need more than one plant and you need to cross pollinate them is how seeds are produced. The uh, fruits, as I mentioned, in uh, conophytum and other members of this family are hydrocastic capsules, which means that they respond to moisture. So on the left-hand side is a dried out fruit of uh, conophytum varicosum here. Um, this is a mature dry fruit. If it's uh, exposed to moisture, just uh, within a couple of minutes, it springs open and reveals the seeds inside. And this is probably a mechanism for the plants in the wild to uh, hold on to their seeds and protect them until water is available. So the, the seeds will be protected inside the capsules until there's a good rainfall that causes the capsules to open up and then the, the seeds can splash out and uh, hopefully have good conditions to germinate with the uh, after the moisture reaches the soil. Conophytum seeds are tiny. So here's a half a dozen conophytum seeds on a quarter. Um, this is conophytum subterraneum. And uh, so they're, they're tiny seeds and the seedlings start out small. So the seeds are sown right on the surface of the soil. They can't be buried at all deeply, otherwise they wouldn't make it to the surface. Um, I sometimes sprinkle just a little bit of sand over the surface of the soil after the seeds are sown just to hold the seeds in place and kind of enable to them to establish that way, kind of hold a little bit of moisture around them. The seeds when they start out need to be kept uh, quite moist. The soil that I use is pretty similar to the uh, soil that I use for adult plants. It's maybe a little bit finer, not as much coarse material in it because the seeds are so small to start out with. Um, in order to germinate, you should keep the uh, seed pots uh, pretty consistently moist uh, uh, for their initial phase. And the seeds usually germinate within a couple of weeks. So most of the seeds will be up. Um, the seeds are so, the seedlings are so tiny when they start out, you know, these little pinhead sized things. Um, you really need to kind of baby them along for a while. So my seed pots, if I'm growing them at home, under lights, I put them 
kind of at the edge of the light fixtures, so they're not getting as much strong light as the adult plants. And uh, they need to be watered more often, so they, they, they easily dry out since they're so tiny. Um, so I keep seed pots uh, definitely more on the moist side than I keep adult plants. Um, they need a little bit more fertilizer too. I think it's good to give them dilute, maybe quarter strength liquid fertilizer as just a spray over the surface uh, every couple of weeks or maybe even once every week. Um, they're so small, you've really got to get the seedlings growing well early on in order to get them large enough to the point where they can uh, survive the summer dormancy. So I, I generally sow seeds in the autumn, in the early autumn, and uh, try and keep them going for the next six or seven months until spring, at which point the, the seeds will really be wanting to go dormant. And if they're not large enough, they can easily sort of die off over the summertime. So it's, uh, I think it's good to start them pretty early on in the cooler season and uh, give them as much time and as much encouragement to grow as possible during their early months to get them up to the size where they're more likely to survive their first summer dormancy. Um, other people grow them in uh, sort of different seasonalities. There are people who try and start their conophytum seeds in the winter time. I think that works better maybe for people who live in more uh, sort of milder climates like they have in England or parts of uh, continental Europe um, where the summers are not as hot and they can kind of baby the seedlings along uh, more easily even if they're small because they were started in January. Um, but here in our more uh, sort of hotter summers and uh, maybe somewhat harsher conditions, I definitely like to start the seeds at the uh, start of autumn, which was sort of the natural time when the seeds would germinate in the wild as well. Here's uh, some older seedlings, uh, getting up to close to half a year old. So there's some seedlings out in the greenhouse right now. And so these are, you know, maybe the size of peppercorns or so. And they're, uh, you know, a good size where they'll be able to make it through the summer and we won't have uh, much mortality during the summer dormancy. And these will be going dormant in uh, probably just a few weeks. Some problems you can have with conophytums, uh, especially with seedlings, you can have damping off. I didn't mention that when I had the photographs of the seedlings, but that's a possibility you can get pythium blight or damping off in small seedlings. And you can apply a sort of broad spectrum fungicide to treat problems like that. If you notice your small seedlings getting kind of glassy and uh, shriveling up and dying, that's a sign of damping off. There's a, a fungal disease or sort of a related to fungal disease that affects mature plants of conophytums. And it's, it's really fatal, but it's kind of disfiguring and uh, unpleasant. And it's, again, something you might want to treat with a broad spectrum fungicide if you get it. But uh, white blister is what this kind of phytum uh, minutum plant has a problem with. And that's these little white lesions. It's uh, probably an albuga or pustula species, which are not technically fungi. They're uh, a group of organisms called oomycetes but they respond to certain fungicidal treatments as well. Um, if you don't have a, a batch of horticultural fungicide, you can sometimes treat problems like this and also black spots on aloes and gasterias and some other uh, succulent plant issues uh, with athlete's foot spray with a, it's, I think the active ingredient is toflinate or something pretty close to that, but uh, those athlete foot sprays uh, are actually effective against a lot of uh, horticultural fungi as well. Um, insect pests, conophytums don't usually get them. Um, I rarely have problems. I think the main insect pest I've seen on my conophytums is uh, root mealybugs, which uh, I think I've wiped them out at this point. I don't have a good photograph of them. I haven't found any in recent years in my collection, but um, that's something where you might want to have to treat them with uh, a systemic uh, insecticide of some type, um, used according to the label directions, of course. Um, it's uh, regular mealybugs and a lot of succulents. You can treat them with alcohol wipes and sort of mechanical control. Um, but uh, root mealybugs are difficult to get rid of without uh, 
resorting to insecticides. Okay, sources. Uh, we're lucky to have two of the best uh, commercial sources of conophytum in the world uh, in the US, so we don't have to deal with uh, import regulations and permits and whatnot. But Mesa Garden in New Mexico and uh, Stephen Hammer's Spheroid Institute in Southern California are both really excellent nurseries. Um, Stephen Hammer is probably the world's expert on conophytum plants. Um, he does sell plants, but he doesn't usually produce a catalog. It's, uh, but you know, find his contact information online and give him a call or send him an email with your requests. And uh, you might be able to work something out if he has uh, extra plants of what you're interested in. Um, lifestyle seeds and Silver Hill seeds in South Africa do sometimes sell conophytum seeds. There's a number of seed banks associated with uh, succulent plant societies that are good sources of conophytum. And it, it depends on what people have donated, but both the Cactus and Succulent Society of America and the MESM study group in the UK um, often have good selections of conophytum species. Um, the MESM study group has, uh, gets in some really special stuff sometimes. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think right now they're able to send seeds outside of uh, the UK. So you've got to have a, a friend in England, maybe you can order for you if you want to get things from their seed bank. Um, eBay, of course, is a thing that exists. Um, be careful. I, I think it almost seems like the, among rare plant sellers on eBay, there's more scammers than there are legitimate sellers. But uh, there's definitely some legitimate people who sell on eBay. These are just a couple that I'm familiar with, uh, Kona Land in Hungary and Mesomaniac in uh, California. I'm sure there's many more that are, you know, above the board, uh, good sellers, but uh, there's a lot of uh, problems as well with eBay and people selling, uh, you know, uh, sesame seeds or things like that instead of rare conophytum seeds. So the sort of second half of the talk is about conophytum diversity. And I've divided up uh, this section of the talk by kind of informal groups that I've come up with. And uh, so not exactly these groups that I've got, this, uh, these seven groups don't exactly line up with the uh, biological sections that the genus is divided up into. But um, they're more based on the appearance of the plants and uh, their, their ecology and how they grow in the wild as well. Um, so yeah, we'll go through some of the conophytum species. Uh, not nearly all of them, but a, sort of a sampling of the diversity in the genus. So this group that I'm calling the bilobes are in a couple of different sections and they're plants uh, where the leaves are not completely fused together into sort of one solid body. And you can sort of very well see in each of these individual bodies how they're actually composed of a pair of leaves and that the leaves are sort of split at the top into two lobes. And it's uh, maybe more obvious that the bodies are pairs of leaves rather than just single structures. Um, this is Conophytum bilobum, one of the most widespread species in the genus and uh, also one of the most variable species. Uh, this particular form is kind of a nicely marked one. It's also got a, a covering of little hairs on the surface of the leaves, so it's uh, kind of pleasantly fuzzy. Other forms in the genus might not have those hairs at all, might be completely smooth, uh, might have these markings, uh, these red markings to various extents or not, and uh, have sort of differences in the shapes of the leaves. In the past, there was many different, uh, probably several dozen, uh, species of conophytum that have now all been sunk into conophytum bilobum. So it's uh, a widespread uh, diverse species. So this is conophytum frutescens, a relative of conophytum bilobum. And it's uh, quite unusual in the genus. It's uh, one of the few conophytums that actually forms stems. And uh, this is kind of a stemmy plant in the greenhouse. And it's got these little trunks at the base of the leaves. Most conophytums are quite compact uh, uh, if they're getting enough light. But this one uh, naturally forms a, a bit of a stem and grows into a small, very small shrub. Uh, even in the wild, the plants do this and they get to be little shrubs with a 
bit of stem beneath, beneath the leaves. It's also unusual in that it has orange flowers. Uh, it's the only natural species in the genus that has orange flowers. There are some hybrids known, usually between uh, purple flowered and uh, yellow flowered species that uh, develop orange flowers. So there's some thought that conifidium frutescens might be an ancient hybrid that has kind of uh, stabilized and established itself in the wild um, in certain parts of South Africa. Conifidium regale, back to the, the royal conifidium from my first slide. This is, uh, you know, such lovely flowers, these neat, fuzzy, soft bodies. Um, the bodies are also windowed on the side, so they're kind of translucent. Uh, right at the point where the lobes come together in these uh, little windowed areas. Um, it's a lovely plant. It's uh, unfortunately probably almost extinct in the wild. It was uh, like a number of conophytum species. It grew in a very limited area and it's kind of been hit by collectors. Uh, this one has been known for a long time. So it's was hit by collectors even in the mid 20th century. Um, it's also a number of conophytum species have had trouble with uh, the very severe drought that South Africa has experienced in the past decade or so. And that may be related to climate change. So that's another threat that these uh, plants are under. But um, it, it came from a very limited area and it was collected and it's had trouble with the drought. And there's uh, apparently very few plants of this left in the wild, unfortunately. Conophytum herianthus, subspecies herianthus, is actually uh, the only conophytum that I know of at the moment that is uh, extinct in the wild. So this is gone completely. It's another one that grew in a very limited spot, really just one mountain, one hill. And uh, it was heavily collected in the mid 20th century. And uh, I visited the spot where it grew with a group uh, in the late 90s, and there was uh, just a single plant left and uh, conophytums not being able to set seed if there's uh, just one plant. Um, that plant was kind of doomed. It wasn't gonna reproduce out there. Um, people have gone back more recently and apparently even that plant is gone. So this uh, may be gone completely from the wild. It is available in cultivation though. So people like Mesa Garden uh, sometimes offer seed or plants of conophytum herianthus. There's uh, two subspecies uh, to Conophytum herianthus. So this is Conophytum herianthus subspecies rex, which is a northern kind of larger variety. And uh, this one is actually doing quite well in the wild. So subspecies herianthus is apparently totally gone from its native habitat. Conophytum herianthus subspecies rex is uh, still pretty widespread and abundant in the northern part of uh, the Richtersveld in the northwestern corner of South Africa. Some of the window plants in the genus Conophytum. So there's a number of different sections in the, in the genus where you find window plants like lithops, where the, uh, the plant mostly lives below ground and just the uh, flat tops of the leaves are exposed and the, those surface of the surfaces of the leaves are translucent. So they let in sunlight to uh, allow the plant to form photosynthesis with the green tissue, which is in the lower parts of the leaves and is hidden away underground. Um, the center of the leaves is actually transparent. It's, uh, so it acts almost like fiber optics. The center of the leaf is filled with this gelatinous water storing tissue that uh, transmits the light that comes in through the windows quite easily and allows the light to penetrate to the, the buried portions of the plant underground where the photosynthetic tissue is. And uh, one of the big groups of uh, window plants in Conophytum is the section Ophthalmophyllum or the eye leaves. This is uh, Conophytum varicosum out in the wild. Conophytum morganii is uh, one of the other window plants in the genus in a section Cheshire Phales. And uh, so it's named after, the section is named after the Cheshire cat because uh, the plants uh, sort of slowly disappear in the spring as they're going dormant. And they, they often disappear completely underground in the wild as uh, the leaves uh, sort of lose moisture and uh, go dormant for the uh, summertime. 
Here's uh, another plant of Conophyta monii. This is in the springtime, and the Conophyta monii is uh, one of various species of Conophytums uh, where the leaves, as they are uh, kind of starting to senesce in the springtime and they're getting ready for dormancy, uh, develop interesting colors. So there's a, a number of forms of Conophyta monii that become uh, bright red or bright purplish like this as they're going dormant in the springtime. The plant would have been uh, much greener than this uh, during the, the midwinter. Conophytum pellucidum is uh, one of a couple of species in the section pellucida, which uh, are, have uh, windows at the tops of their leaves. And here it is uh, growing out in the wild on a, on a granite dome in Namaqua land. And here's another form of it in a pot. There's a lot of different forms of Conophytum pellucidum. If you go to the Mesa Garden website, there's a sort of page after page of different seed of different forms of pellucidum from different localities, which you can try out with sort of variation in the form of the windows and the, the texture of the plant and the, the coloration of the leaves and the flowers. So it's a, another fairly variable species. There's a, there's a few hybrids and cultivars in conophytums, and I don't grow too many of them. I'm not really a specialist in that sort of thing, but this is a neat one. This is conophytum pellucidum Macon's plum, which was a selection developed by Brian Macon. He's from, from the UK, uh, based on some wild seedlings that he grew up that were unusually purplish colored, but uh, kind of a nice one. Conophytum concavum is uh, in section subfenestrata. And the section na name there means uh, somewhat less than windowed. And uh, the species in this section, there's two of them only, have a uh, sort of uh, kind of translucent to somewhat opaque windows, kind of blurry windows on the tops of their leaves. Conophytum subterraneum is a relatively recent discovery. It's, well, it's been a while now, but uh, it was uh, earlier this century, this one was discovered in a kind of remote part of the Richtersfeld. But a neat little cone-shaped thing, uh, mostly lives underground as the name implies in the wild. Um, in cultivation, they tend to grow more above the surface and uh, with the, the leaf bodies mostly above the surface of the soil. Conophytum acabenza is one of the tiniest conophytums, and it's just got these little tiny windowed areas at the tops of the leaves. Like Conophytum subterraneum, this is one that would definitely be mostly underground if it was going out in the wild. But these are only the size of, you know, sort of match heads and a little bit of the match stick upside down stuck into the soil. Um, it's about how big they are. There's a penny here for scale. But uh, one of the tiniest conophytums. Conophytum hammeri, named after Steve Hammer, that guy out in California, the, the big expert on conophytum. Um, this is one that was found uh, only in the 1990s, even though it lives in an area that must have been botanized uh, many times in the past. I think it was maybe only found so relatively late in the history of conophytum exploration is that it's uh, really well camouflaged. I've seen this in the wild in a number of spots in my trips to South Africa. And it's, it's really hard to find these plants. It's uh, one of a number of conophytum species that's specialized for growing in fields that are covered by quartz pebbles and often little else. So uh, these big flats uh, that are covered by snow white bits of broken quartz. And uh, these uh, white plants uh, really hide quite well there. Um, so they're very hard to find and people I think overlooked them probably for many years. It's uh, one of two species of conophytum where uh, the old leaves dry up to this uh, pale white leaf sheath. And uh, unlike many other conophytums, the, the new leaves at the start of the growing season never break out of the old uh, dried up leaf sheath. Um, so they kind of perpetually hide underneath the dried up remains of uh, previous year's leaves. Um, and in the wild, that's definitely part of their camouflage, what keeps them so well hidden. Um, Conophytum hammeri is uh, one of a, a number of species in Conophytum that are uh, nocturnally flowering. So uh, these flowers, this photo was taken during the daytime, the flowers are closed up 
after dark, those flowers will open up and they're very strongly fragrant. Um, if, I, if I've got some of these in the basement under lights and the, if I walk into the basement during the blooming season, I'll know when these start to flower just because of the fragrance. Uh, they, they fill up the whole basement with this uh, sort of sweet floral fragrance. And presumably uh, with that, they attract moths which pollinate them is uh, probably what pollinates them. I'm not sure if anybody's actually observed that in the wild. Probably kind of closely related to Conophytum hammeri is Conophytum burgeri or burger's onion. And uh, this is another species that hides underneath the dried up remains of old, le old leaves, even during the growing season. And these get to be, it's a, sort of a similar plant to Conophytum hammeri, but uh, has uh, daytime flowers. This has pink uh, flowers during the daytime. Um, it's also quite a larger plant than uh, Conophytum hammeri. These get to be the size of probably small hen's eggs uh, eventually. It's slow growing, but uh, eventually reaches quite large sizes. So Conophytums that flower in the day and form little clusters of leaves. This is Conophytum minutum. I had a photograph of this uh, from Habitat early on in the presentation. This is a related plant uh, in cultivation in the greenhouse in bloom. Conophytum bachelorum is a neat one in this uh, sort of general group of plants. Uh, also like Conophytum minutum, it's in section Vetsteinia. Um, Conophytum bachelorum is a plant that was discovered in the 1970s and then uh, sort of lost for a while. It was rediscovered uh, in 2004, I think it was. Um, I and some other people collected some seeds uh, responsibly and with permits in South Africa and I uh, brought it back into cultivation. And that's how I uh, developed these plants here in the greenhouse. Um, but they develop this reddish coloration at the start of the growing season in autumn. Um, they get kind of greener during the winter time. Um, and they're quite large plants. They're sort of the size of dimes or uh, uh, maybe nickels or so. Uh, fairly large diameter plants as conophytums go. Unfortunately, this is one that's been hit very hard by illegal collecting in recent years. And uh, apparently just uh, people have gone back to the site where this grows uh, or used to grow recently and uh, been unable to find much in the way of plants at all. It uh, seems to have been almost entirely wiped out in the wild uh, by uh, poaching uh, just within the past two years. This is Conophytum ernstii, um, another member of the section Wetsteinia. This is another one, unfortunately, that's uh, you know having conservation problems right now. It grows in a very remote area by the Namibian border and the border of Namibia and South Africa. Um, it's so it's probably not threatened by poachers at this point, um, but it's uh, apparently suffered very severely from the droughts in recent years, and uh, a lot of the plants are dead uh, just from lack of moisture in uh, the place where it grows in the wild. Um, not too much trouble to grow it uh, in a window or uh, under lights in cultivation now. Conophytum flavum is uh, one of the yellow flowered members of this group of the section Betsteinia. Conophytum minusculum subspecies Istoflorens is a form of this uh, very small bodied species uh, that flowers during the summertime. That's what this uh, Istoflorens part of its name means. Um, Conophytum minusculum is indeed uh, quite a small plant. These are also kind of match head size, these individual heads here in this large cluster. Conophytum cubicum is one of a couple of species of Conophytum that uh, have heads, uh, body, plant bodies that are more square than round. They tend to be uh, sort of squared off the individual heads and cross section. So uh, kind of an unusual thing. It's actually fairly easy in cultivation. It's a neat plant, um, but probably one of the easier conophytums to keep going on a, on a windowsill or under lights. That's uh, despite the place where it grows, it grows in an extremely arid remote part of the, the Richtersveld in Northern South Africa, Northwestern South Africa. 
And, uh, but for some reason it adapts quite well and it's fairly vigorous in cultivation as conophytums go. The flowers are spectacular when it does bloom. Um, the flowers are quite large compared to the size of the plant and probably some of the largest flowers in the genus. Conophytum kamiesbergensa. It's an interesting thing. It grows at the top of the Kamiesberg Mountains, which is uh, one of the colder places in the distribution of conophytum. Uh, this one, on a really regular basis, I think, probably on an almost yearly basis, uh, winds up being covered by wet snow and experiencing uh, some pretty hard frosts uh, where it grows in the wild. So it's, uh, I, I doubt it would be cold hardy in our part of the world, but it's uh, probably about as close as a, to a cold hardy conophytum as you can get. It's uh, not much cultivated. It tends to sort of have trouble in uh, warmer weather as you might expect. Um, uh, people often lose it during the summertime, I think, if it gets too hot. Uh, nocturnally flowered uh, clumping conophytum plants. This is conophytum angeliki, which uh, grows in a broad area in uh, northern South Africa and also southern Namibia. But this is a photograph taken during the daytime and the flowers are kind of closed up, but they like conophytum hammeri. These will open up at night and uh, are also quite fragrant. There's a, a neat form of conophytum angelica. This is, this is subspecies tetragonum. Um, just sometimes kind of square. This particular plant is not as square as some of uh, plants of some species tetragonum sometimes get, but uh, often the plant bodies are really square in outline. But it's a, it's a nice form. This is a collection from uh, uh, Peter Brains, a South African collector. He uh, found it in Namibia a number of years back. It's a, kind of a famous form of this plant, especially a nice one. Conophytum saxitanum uh, here in habitat uh, right near the Atlantic Ocean in Namibia. Um, you can see the ocean in the background there. Um, another species of nocturnally flowered clumping plant. You can see a couple of them down there. Conophytum stephanii is a member of the section Barbata, which is uh, one of the characteristics of spe species in that section is the leaves are covered with little hairs. So it's uh, one of the hairier conophytums. Conophytum armianum is a tiny little thing. It's a minute little clumping plant uh, with nocturnal flowers uh, from the Richtersveld area in Northern South Africa. And uh, it has these interesting little bumps all over the surface. Mine in the greenhouse never looked quite like that. This is a habitat photograph uh, from uh, Mr. Wellwich. And the living stones, and uh, I'm sort of, putting, uh, I guess a lot of conophytums could be considered living stones to one extent or another. Um, but the uh, section cataphracta of the genus is especially good in that regard. It's uh, you know half a dozen or so species, species that are closely related um, with uh, a lot of adaptations to living in very dry exposed environments. These are always plants that in the wild uh, grow in full sun and uh, kind of uh, the, the, the harsher sort of microenvironments that conophytums live in. Um, they have very light colored uh, skins to the leaves, which are full of little calcium oxalate crystals, which help to reflect away sunlight and make the leaves quite tough. Um, they've got other adaptations, adaptations to drought, like uh, stomata, the, the breathing pores of the plant are sunken beneath the surface of the leaves and tiny little crypts, which probably help to prevent excessive water loss. So the living stones in the section cataphracta are kind of especially rock-like conophytums maybe. There's a lot of different forms of this species, conophytum pagii. This is one of the forms with a kind of nice red markings around the gap in between the two leaves where the flower would emerge. There's a conophytum pagii. This is a, a form that would have been called in the past conophytum sabrisum with a sort of yellowish flowers and larger bodies. These are maybe olive size or so. Conophytum pagii is probably the uh, most widespread, the, the largest distribution of any conophytum. It grows uh, 
from fairly far south around Calvinia, north of Cape Town, all the way up into southern Namibia. So it's uh, the largest range of any individual Conophytum species. Conophytum stevens jonesianum is another in this group. And you can see a little nest of them here growing in the gravel uh, with, uh, I think that's Crassula alstonii in habitat. And Conophytum calculus uh, subspecies vanzilii sometimes is considered a separate species is uh, from Bushman land, uh, sort of the west or the eastern part of the distribution of Conophytum. And I'll talk about a few uh, Conophytums that are rock pan denizens. So there's a number of Conophytum species that grow in very shallow soil and sand and gravel uh, on top of bedrock, uh, usually on the tops of rocky hills and mountains. And there, there's a number of Conophytum species in several different sections that are specialized in growing in that kind of environment. Um, this is Conophytum rudii, a photograph from Chris Rogerson, the famous uh, British Conophytum researcher taken in South Africa. And here's one of my photographs from South Africa. This is uh, Conophytum rudii again, is the bigger green one here. And then all these little gray ones just hiding down among the gravel are Conophytum depressum, um, which is often one of the most difficult Conophytums to find in the wild. It's uh, usually you don't see the plants at all. They're hiding underneath the layer of sand and the gravel on top of these shallow pans that they grow in. And they're not exposed to uh, the air at all. They're completely hidden underneath the sand at the top of the soil layer. So you have to sort of find a likely looking pan and gently brush this, brush aside the uh, gravel a little bit. And if you're lucky, you might find a nest of Conophytum depressum. Conophytum rugosum is another pan dweller and it often grows in the same sorts of places as Conophytum uh, uh, depressum. So often comes, or yeah, grows in the same types of environments. Conophytum rudii subspecies sanguineum is an especially nice form of the species with these bright red leaves. Sanguineum because of its uh, resemblance to blood, I guess. This is another one that's unfortunately been hit very hard by uh, illegal collecting in recent years and uh, we never had a large distribution. So it's another one that's uh, probably in trouble in the wild. It's critically endangered at least and uh, maybe almost extinct in the wild at this point, unfortunately. Fairly difficult to grow in cultivation as well. So uh, doesn't do well for a lot of people. Um, one uh, hint to keeping something like this growing and uh, some of the other pan dwelling plants is they seem to be kind of uh, maybe kind of short lived plants in their native environment and they rely on kind of regenerating from seed periodically. So when you're growing them in a pot, it does seem to help to divide them and give them fresh soil and sort of restart them from cuttings on a fairly regular basis that may help to keep them going. But a slightly difficult plant. And I'll finish off with my whirlwind tour of Conophytum diversity with a number of species and a number of different sections that are camouflaged like lichens in their native habitat. And they, they grow in uh, kind of on sheets of rock often, but um, areas where there's a lot of lichens and they hide among the lichens and the, the coloration of the leaves really blends in and uh, makes them kind of hard to see in their native habitat. So this is Conophytum terrigerum, which is uh, the Conophytum with the southernmost distribution of any species. Uh, this grows almost in Cape Town, sort of in the Cape Town metropolitan area. This grows on a couple of hills. Uh, so this grows uh, in the middle of what's actually uh, kind of an agricultural area where there's a lot of vineyards and uh, winter wheat fields as well. Um, fortunately, it grows up on the top of these kind of inaccessible rocky areas. And it's uh, not really been threatened like a lot of plants in that part of South Africa have been by agriculture. And uh, I don't think it's been uh, overly collected at this point, at least from what I've heard. By succulent plant fans. 
Uh, conophyta minimum, this is uh, kind of a nice form of that species uh, that used to be called Conophyta wittebergensa. So it's uh, another one that has this kind of pattern to the leaves where their leaves are a grayish green color with these darker reddish or almost sometimes blackish in some cases markings on them that resemble lichens if you see them out in the wild. Conophytum comptoniae grows uh, around the town of Van Reinsdorp in uh, Namaqualand and southern Namaqualand. And it's another one that uh, grows among lichens. It can also grow as a pan plant. Like I said, these uh, divisions that I'm dividing this talk in are uh, sort of a little bit arbitrary and uh, sometimes plants might fit pretty well into more than one category. So this is a lichen mimic. It also sometimes grows in, in pans of gravel. So it could be a pan dweller. And I'll finish off here with a shot of this uh, quite nice form of Conophyta mob cordellum. This is uh, a form that would have been uh, called in the past Conophytum decoratum uh, because of the sort of spectacular coloration you get in the leaves. Um, so yeah, this is uh, another lichen dwelling plant with this sort of lichen camouflage to the surface. Um, yeah, that's about it. This was a funny thing. Uh, the, the new version of PowerPoint, or I guess probably it's been like this for a while, uh, PowerPoint will try and come up with a caption for the site impaired uh, for your photographs if you add photographs to a PowerPoint presentation. Um, for most of the conophytums, it sort of labels them as rocks or as uh, bowls of fruit or things like that, which you can sort of see. Uh, this photograph uh, completely broke the program. It came up with something that wasn't even English for it. Not, not good English anyway. Was, uh, <laughs> I'm trying to remember what it was. It was something like a photograph containing indoors and various. It just didn't make any sense. So it's kind of uh, beautiful though. Yeah, it's a lovely plant. Well, thank you so much. I mean, we have a bunch of questions in the chat for you if you're willing to field some of yeah. these. But really, this was an incredible thing to, uh, I learned so much just from the slides and hearing you speak. It was amazing. Um, thank yeah. you so much. Well, and for everyone, <laughs> for everyone else who's in the chat right now, or in, sorry, in uh, this Zoom, please feel free to add any further questions to the chat if you know how to do that. Um, Should I stop sharing and... Uh... Switch it over to. Yeah, this is great. Yeah. Um, do you want? I, I can go through the chat and just shoot you these questions if that's helpful. All right. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay, I'm gonna get up back up to the top. Um, so the first question we have is just about propagation versus growing. Uh, yeah, propagation and vegetative growth and seed growth and how hard it is to do that and if you have a suggestion on one versus the other. Oh, yeah, I think it's it's the usual sort of trade-off you get with vegetative propagation versus seed propagation. Uh, with seed, it's, uh, it's cheaper. It's cheaper to get seed generally, and uh, you can often get a lot of plants that way. Um, but it's slower and it's more difficult and, you know, with cuttings, you, you get a little plant right there the first season and it's probably a mature flowering size plant mm -hmm. right away. And it's, uh, with cuttings, it's, you know, it's quicker and more reliable and you get an exact copy of the plant if that's important for you. Um, so yeah, there's, you know, various advantages one way or the other. I'd say that growing from seed is definitely a slower, more difficult process. You really have to baby along the little seedlings uh, when you're getting them started. For growing from vegetative growth and propagating, um, so you're basically, because I'm thinking about the plants that I have at home, just like snipping off a little head beneath, once you have, a, you can see a little bit of the root and then you're sort of cutting it there. From that cutting, do you then grow in like the normal um, soil mix that you had had, or would you grow straight in pumice or perlite? Is there any best practices there? 
Oh yeah, I pot them up in uh, just the same thing as the adult plants. Uh, okay. You know, maybe a little bit more sand. Okay. I think it helps. Uh, you know, they are small plants. It's it might be tough to establish them in pumice. Yeah. Uh, that, that. Yeah, just pure pumice would probably be a little bit too coarse and too many air spaces. Because I've heard a lot, like, I mean, there's so much different information out, out there about growing the mesums on the East Coast. And I've heard a lot of people trying to grow strictly in pumice or something that's just incredibly well draining. And I had done that for a while and hadn't had great success with that. Um, yeah, so I mean, you know, I go on the Facebook group, the MSM face group, Facebook group, and uh, you see a lot of people's plants that are really wrinkly and obviously not getting any water into them. And mm -hmm. people are often growing them in pumice or like coir pellets or things like that. Yeah. So you, you can't have, they're such small plants, you can't have too loose a mixture. Right. Um, they're, they're very fine roots and that they need something to root into to that'll hold a little bit of water for them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, with bigger plants, uh, you know, with a lot of cacti and mammillaries and things, you can get away with growing them in uh, very coarse mixtures with a, a lot of uh, pumice or other coarse material like that. But uh, yeah, I don't think conophytums really appreciate that sort of mix. It's hard to okay. get them to root properly. That's really good to know. Um, one other thing that I, I was just thinking as we're discussing this is, I, I probably have a lot of my plants in two course of a mixture. Is there a time of the year that you would recommend uh, that would be most healthy to repot the plants? Yeah, probably the, the ideal time of the year to repot is uh, in the autumn. Okay. Um, yeah, it's probably not a great time of year to repot right now since the plants are uh, kind of coasting towards dormancy at this uh, point. Right. Um, and, you know, I mentioned that Steve Hammer only sells plant. I think I mentioned this, I, I meant to mention it, that Steve Hammer only sells conophytum plants in the fall. Um, right. He tries not to send them out this time of year because people do have a harder time uh, reestablishing plants and uh, transplanting them in the springtime. Interesting. Compared to the fall. Um, and I'm just, I'm kind of jumping around here for, for a few different questions just to keep a train of thought. Um, in general, like, are there any sort of visual signs that you would suggest looking for in terms of figuring out how your plant is doing? Um, for me, like, I have my conifidum growing right now, and I think I probably overwatered them this growing season because they have a little bit of cracks in them. Like, it seems like they're just, they were too, too full of water. Um, and yeah, definitely. That's a sign of uh, too much water or too much fertilizer or not mm -hmm. enough light when the plants mm -hmm. are very green and actually cracking open during the mm -hmm. growing season. Um, so yeah, I mean, it sometimes happens even in the greenhouse, even despite my best efforts. So. Mm -hmm get a little bit of cracking, especially if it's uh, sort of a dark, uh, dank winter. Um, this winter has been on the brighter side, it seems like. But uh, yeah, it's generally not fatal. It, you know, it, it might invite uh, some kind of uh, fungal infection, but uh, mm. it's generally uh, something that the plant can recover from. It's one of the nice things about conophytums is they do renew their leaves uh, completely every year. So you know, leaves this year might look bad and get kind of cracked if they're overwatered during a cloudy period in January, but uh, right. next year they'll start over again with a nice fresh set of leaves and you've got a chance to improve things. How often are you watering your plants that are grown on windowsills or under lights? Yeah, maybe should have talked about that some more during the presentation. Um, I'd say for my plants at home, are, which are you know mostly under the lights and uh, you know mostly in kind of a cooler basement is where I've got them now. Um, I water them maybe once a week during the growing season. Okay. Plants that are just on the windowsill and just rely on that uh, natural light and uh, you know probably stay a little bit cooler and don't 
get quite as much light as the uh, ones with the supplemental lights. Uh, mm -hmm. Water them probably, you know, every couple of weeks, not that okay. often. Are there any signs you look for in the plants when you feel like you know they should be watered? Like in my experience, and it's very limited and sort of, you know, not completely informed, but if I see the plants during their growing season start to shrivel up, I'll know it's time to water or I'll water them extra if they haven't really perked up after a week or so. Yeah, no, that's it exactly. If, uh, you know, you're getting into October or November and uh, the conophytums are maybe out of their old leaf sheaths, but the new leaves are wrinkled, uh, you know, mm -hmm. showing little furrows in them. Um, it's a sign that the plant's not getting enough water and you can probably okay. step up the watering a bit, you know, assuming you have decent light. Uh, it's, you know, it's always sort of a balancing act. The you yeah. know, just, uh, adjust your watering depending on how dry your conditions are and how much light the plants are getting. Um, with more light, you can definitely get away with watering more. Yeah. But uh, yeah, when you start to see some wrinkles on the leaves during the growing season, you can hold off on watering a bit. And in terms of where we're at now in their, the conifidum growing season, are there any visual signs that we should be looking for that plants are ready to enter their dormancy or that they're not ready and should be watered a bit more? Right. Um, it's often more of a color change than in anything mm. else in uh, well-grown conophytums that indicate that they're kind of heading into dormancy. Um, but the leaves will start to get paler and yellower, and that's a sign that they're, they're really want to go to sleep and are sort of heading towards their summer dormancy. Um, they, they might wrinkle a little bit more depending on your conditions and the mm -hmm. species as well, but it's, it's mostly the leaves, uh, you know, they, they might have kind of a burst of intense colorations like we saw with Conophyta monii in the presentation, mm -hmm. but then the, the leaves start to lose their color and uh, maybe shrivel a bit, and that's a sign that they're heading into their dormant period. And okay. it sort of depends on the species when exactly that happens. Uh, some of my conophytums, like Conophytum angelici, have mostly gone dormant already at this stage. Others, uh, like uh, Conophytum bilobum and Conophytum calculus, uh, I've really got to sort of work at not watering those and getting them to go dormant. And the, even June or July, they might be sort of trying to hold on to their old leaves. They're such tough plants. Um, if a uh, conophytum is uh, like conophytum bilobum is really holding onto its leaves too late into the summertime, too late into its uh, supposed dormant period, I sometimes will even go in and uh, sort of uh, pick off some of the old leaf and uh, mm -hmm. try and uh, wound it a little bit and break it open. And uh, yeah, I've, I've really often dry up that way. I've often wondered if if I'm being too insertive into a natural process by doing that with lithops in particular. Like I'm worried that sometimes if I don't peel off the dead uh, old leaves that the new leaves won't even be able to break through. But it's nice to hear that that is something that is okay to do. Yeah, it's something I do. Um, okay. The other questions that we have, um, we have a few specifically about flowering. Mm -hmm. um, the first in general is just how often are you seeing your plants in cultivation under lights flower? Is it consistently year after year? Is it sort of it's depending on- consistent. I'd say it's not quite as good as it is uh, out in the greenhouse in uh, natural full sun, um, but you know, pretty good. Um, yeah, I'd say most conophytums uh, flower uh, pretty reliably for me uh, under mm -hmm. lights. Okay. Is there anything specific about the color range for the lighting that you're using that uh, you think is specific to conophytum? No. Um, yeah, I, I just kind of went on Amazon and found something that seemed to be about the right size and the right wattage and said that it was broad spectrum and got that. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, nothing, nothing special. Um, okay. Yeah, I haven't messed around with, you know, trying to adjust the, the spectrum of the light 
for different times of year or to encourage flowering or things like that, that you know, certain people who grow under lights do for certain sorts of plants. Um, I haven't yeah. tried that. I just have gotten these, uh, you know, either cool daylight or wide spectrum lights and uh, just use those. It seems like it's working pretty well for you then. Yeah, yeah, I think I have uh, good luck with the plants under lights, even though even the ones that don't get a huge amount of natural light, they do okay. And then well, I have another question about flowering and is there a, like a wide range over the course of the year when different species will flower or is it generally in a smaller window of time? Yeah, the kind of the overwhelming majority of conophytums flower in the autumn. So, uh, you know, sort of September through October for us and uh, the opposite time of year, more like April for uh, the plants in their native environment in South Africa. Um, there are a few exceptions. Uh, so pretty much any month of the year, there might be a conophytum that has a few flowers on it. So there's a, a few species that flower in the dead of winter, like conophytum brainsii, which I didn't mention in the talk, but uh, mm -hmm. that's a winter flower. That conophytum bachelorum, that uh, top-shaped one that's very endangered right now with the kind of reddish color in the fall, mm -hmm. that flowers in the spring. So that's in full bloom for me right now. Oh, wow. Um, flower is about six months off of most other conophytums. Interesting. There's actually a new species, uh, conophytum confusum, that I was involved in this description of. I'm one of the authors on that description. And it looks pretty similar to a small form of conophytum bachelorum, but it flowers in the, in the normal season. So it flowers in the autumn. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas uh, the real conophytum bachelorum flowers uh, in the springtime. Is that why it's called confusum? Yep. Oh, interesting. <laughs> could could very easily be confused with conophytum bachelorum, but flowers mm -hmm. about six months off, and that seems to be pretty reliable. Interesting. Um, from habitat observations and uh, uh, for from the plants in cultivation, how they behave uh, in the greenhouse. Would you say that um, probably a good species? <laughs> Maybe. Would you say that? Uh, for plants in cultivation that do not flower, is it the lack of light that usually is the cause of that or is it just a bunch of different factors? Yeah, most likely. I mean, yeah. I started growing out, growing conophytums uh, many years ago, back when I was in high school or so, um, just on windowsills with natural light. And it was always a struggle to get them enough light and they, they didn't flower that much for me. And I, you know, it's as soon as I got access to greenhouses and started experimenting with lights and, uh, you know, getting the more supplemental light or more natural sunlight that way, mm -hmm. uh, it's, you, you see a big difference in how much they flower. They, they flower much better if uh, they get brighter light. And I think that is the difference is the amount of sun they get or artificial okay. light. Uh, I, I personally had one question. So on a lot of the plants, when you're showing photos, you'll see when the plant is actually, the leaf pair is actually growing and in the growing season, you don't see a lot of dots on them so in certain species. And then when the actual leaf pair dries out, that's when certain dots will, and coloration oh, yeah. and patterns will come out. Is Do you know the reason for that? Yep, yeah, I know what you mean. Uh, yeah, that's true. Uh, you know, some of them have, with the living leaves, they do have uh, sort of patterns of spots. Mm -hmm. Or whatever, but yeah, most conophytum species have uh, special cells inside of them that store tannins. Mm -hmm. um, so th these very dark uh, colored, uh, kind of astringent, probably uh, herbivore deterring chemicals. That's uh, you know what would give oak leaves their brown color in the fall, mm. and uh, so the. And these tannin cells, when the leaves dry out in the summertime, they, they become much more obvious. And that's what you see is uh, sort of these very dark dots on old dried up conophytum leaves. Is those are the, the tannin cells that were inside of the leaves. Um, yeah, because I've often the, wondered with what if I've you know acquired a new plant and it has these old leaf pairs that have dried out and I see coloration or patterns on it. And then when they 
grow the next year, they don't have them. I often wonder if I'm doing something wrong or if they're not getting enough light or what it is, but that's interesting yeah, no, to hear that. Not. Yeah. Not necessarily. I get it. Obviously it will depend on the species, but yeah, I've always wondered. Yep. Um, and I just have two more questions if you have time, if that's okay. Yeah. Okay, so Zach is asking, and I'm just gonna read his question verbatim. So compared to the other flora of the area, conos are so small, non-photosynthetic colored and have such unique coping mechanisms. How do you think they evolved to be this way? And do you think this is helpful for the increased aridity caused by climate change? Yeah, well, that's a big question. Um, yeah. It's, uh, the last part first, um, Unfortunately, I think uh, the evidence from the field is uh, that with the, the increased droughts we've had uh, in South Africa, especially in recent years, that conophytums are actually kind of struggling a bit, that they, they may be plants that are, you know, sort of specialists, um, you know, adapted to very particular types of environments and types of climatic conditions. And they may not cope very well with climate change, and uh, they might kind of be in trouble. And when you when you think about the geography of Southern Africa, they don't really have anywhere to go further towards the pole than much uh, much further to go than where they are now. They're, there's just sort of the the South Atlantic and the ocean until Antarctica uh, to the south of where they are now. So that they, they may mm -hmm. not be able to move very much. Right. Um, so it's, I think in general, people who work in South Africa think that conophytum and other uh, little specialist succulent plants might have a lot of trouble with climate change. Um, as to why they're so small, I mean, definitely where they grow, there are shrubbier plants often as well, and, uh, you know, different sorts of life forms and uh, different sorts of strategies for living in these environments. Uh, often I would say conophytums grow in kind of marginal habitats, places like these shallow rock pans or kind of among boulders or in very stony soil where other plants and maybe larger plants and shrubs and bulbs don't do very well and can't get established. Mm -hmm. um, so, and the, these very tiny little specialist succulents like conophytum uh, might be able to adapt to those types of environments and survive on fairly lean, uh, you know, little soil, poor soil, a lot of rocks and uh, not as much nutrients or water available as in maybe other parts of the same habitat where larger shrubbier succulents might live. Mm -hmm. um, they, they often grow, I would say, one characteristic of conophytum habitats is they grow in very stable environments. So they're, they're not growing in shifting sands, which you sometimes see in some parts of the range of conophytum. There are sort of less stable, softer, sandy soils that are probably churned up by animals and blown mm -hmm. around by the wind and that are where the environment is not very stable and changes a lot. And you don't really see conophytums there in that type of environment. So they, they grow in spots that are harsh, but maybe more stable than other micro habitats in uh, their range. Yeah, I feel like when I've seen photos I've seen of clustered groups in habitat are usually in the crevices of, of very large rocks. Mm -hmm. So it seems yep. very stable. And they're just growing basically, like, I mean, is there any soil or organic material in those crevices or is it basically you know, just off the rock? Probably not much. Uh, you know, there's, you know, they'd generally be growing in a crevice there and there, there'd be a little bit of soil in the, in the crack between the two chunks of rock. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, probably not much. Uh, the, the crack might go back into the rock quite a bit and yeah. you know, have some room for the roots to spread out. But, uh, yeah, conophytums often have a, sort of a weak root system, sort of a, a poorly developed shallow root system and mm -hmm. that may be related to that type of habitat as well. Uh, lithops, uh, if you've grown lithops or received lithops in the mail bare root, they often have uh, quite a deep taproot. So lithops have a 
more of a taproot type root system. Conophytum's the root system is softened, mm -hmm. more fibrous and more superficial. Mm -hmm. um, and last question. So we here at, with the LESCSS as COVID, you know, as starts to be a little bit safer to venture out into the world, we'd love to start setting up some site visits and group trips. And we're wondering if there's a point at which we could maybe come up and visit the uh, Yukon collection. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's, um, you know, we're only 70 or 80 miles away from New York City. So it's, yeah, it's not, not that bad. far away. Uh, it may take a little bit, bit of time to get up here, but uh, definitely you'd be welcome to visit. Um, the greenhouses are closed to the public right now. It's just uh, sort of students and staff are allowed in the greenhouses at the moment, but that will change at some point. And uh, I would, I'm not sure when exactly they'll change the, the protocols on visiting campus, but uh, I would guess maybe not this spring or summer, but maybe, maybe in the fall, we might see the campus opening up to uh, you know, sort of out outside groups, or if you want to um, take a classroom and conduct a meeting here and then see the greenhouses or something like that. That would be amazing. Be arrange it at that point. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll play it by ear and see how, how things are going, but we would love, obviously, to come up. And everyone who's here now uh, listening, we're going to start putting some stuff together as it gets safe to do so, and uh, we'll let people know. Right. Yeah. Stay in touch. And uh, yeah, I'm sure we, we'll be able to work out something for some point in the future. Definitely. Well, thank you again so much. I really, we all really appreciate it. This was so no informative problem. and so exciting. And uh, for everybody here who's in the chat, I'm just going to add this donate link one more time. Uh, this is our donate link for trying to get a community greenhouse set up for uh, the community in the Lower East Side and Chinatown. Um, it's something we've been working on for the past almost year now. Um, and yeah, we're still just working towards it. We want to do a lot more of these events in person and a lot more community oriented events in the Lower East Side. Um, so if you're able to just follow that link and or share this stuff and help us work towards that goal. Um, again, thanks so much, Matt. We really appreciate it. And uh, no we'll talk problem. to you soon. Yeah. All right, yeah, awesome. we can see in person, see you in person sometime. I would love that. All right, thanks everybody. Thanks for coming and thanks Thank again. You. Thanks again, Matt. Thanks. No problem. All right. Look forward Bye. To, to seeing the collection. Yeah. Yep. Bye, right, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.